evening and welcome to the Oshkosh Area School District Board of Education regular meeting for Wednesday, March 6, 2019. Has this meeting been properly noticed? Yes, it has. Would you please call the roll? Carlin? Here. Eliason? Evans? Here. Garner? Persaud? Here. Olmstead? Here. Peschel? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. At this time, we are going to call on a Carl Traeger middle school student. Kelso Collins is here tonight to lead us in the pledge, so we'll welcome him up to the front. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We like to have students at our meetings because that's the reason we're here for our students. So, Kelso, it's been a pleasure meeting you tonight, and I uh, appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to do that. So, thanks for coming. With that, we'll move on to board and administrative reports, um, starting with the board, super, uh, board president report tonight. Um, I continue to be so impressed with the way our students are covered in the media, whether that's uh, the, the news media, uh, the uh, print media, or the, the oral media, namely uh, uh, TV and radios, uh, and also in their, their school newsletters. I know that recently there was a display of artwork put up in the Oshkosh Public Library for the Helen Farnsworth Mears Annual Contest. And last Saturday, uh, which was the first Saturday of the month, there were two sites in downtown Oshkosh that featured artwork of Oshkosh Area School District students. So congratulations to, congratulations to all the students awesome. and to their teachers who support them and their families who support them as well. Last week was Read Across America uh, in the United States, uh, largely to help celebrate the anniversary of the birthday of the uh, author popularly known as Dr. Seuss, and I want to give a shout out to two Oaklawn fifth grade classrooms that invited me to come and share with them. It was a delight to be out there and, and see what was really going on in, <laughs> in the schools. And the students were very well behaved, and so I had a good time. So thank you to our teachers who organized those events across our schools last week. And with that, I'll turn this over to the superintendent Thank for you. her report. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. So um, I don't want to delay on this whatsoever, but I wanted to go ahead and start with Michaela for an update. So I'm from West, and this is our March, March update. So to start off with sports, we are coming to the end of our basketball season and our gymnastics season. Both teams did a great job, and with all the injuries on the basketball team this season, they really pulled through and did a great job. Um, more on sports, the track season is coming out. These are some pictures from last year. They had a lot of fun last year, and I, having spoken to a lot of the athletes, are they are all looking forward to the beginning of the season. Um, looking more at the music department, the music department is currently working on the spring musical. The Drowsy Chaperone, members of the choir, band, and orchestra are all in, involved in the cast, and therefore it brings together all the students at West, and I feel that this is really going to be a great performance by all of them. Um, also, the Solon Ensemble was very successful for many students as they are sending dozens of the members of the band and orchestra to UWO for the state conference in order to compete there. Uh, more on clubs, the Rotary Department, they, are, they have been getting really involved in the community, le community lately as they have gone to many conferences and spoken with many businesses in regards to how the school can get more involved and uh, how students can really immerse themselves within the community. Uh, the Oshkosh West Index is always working and our next production is going to be next week so we are always looking for more stories and more people to get involved with that. And then <coughs> AP courses, we are in full AP season as study sessions and many students are beginning to really buckle down on getting ready for those big tests coming in May. Uh, more on clubs, on the right is the state conference for DECA. We were there on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We actually got back in a, about an hour ago. So we, everyone did very well, the five of us. There are three of us going to ICDC, which is the international conference in May. So it was very exciting. And then on the left is mock trials. Mock, state for mock trials is gonna be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So it's gonna be very exciting to see how we do there. 
Um, more miscellaneous, but also on sports. These two students, Brecca Betcher and Thomas Hendricks, were both featured in the most recent FBA conference um, recognition, so that was pretty exciting for them. And then our student government recently went to a leadership conference in Madison. It was a great way for all of us to really kind of look at other schools and how they are running things and for all of us to just kind of compare how we handle certain issues or how we all come up with different ideas on how to get students more involved. And then upcoming events, we are holding a talent show on the 21st at West and then National Honor, the National Honor Society Awards Night is going to be on the 11th and the first baseball season first baseball season game is going to be on the 1st of April. Oh my gosh, do you think the snow will be gone? Have a great month. Do you have a time of the talent show? Not yet, because we're trying to coordinate around some of the sports that are going to be okay. going to be in the gym. It'll probably be between 7 to 8-ish. Okay. Michaela, okay, congratulations to you personally you. as well. Yeah. That, that's a nice accomplishment. No, Thank you. My kids well in line. Yeah, so I'm from North, and so this is some stuff that we had the last month. First of all, uh, a lot of students from Polaris <laughs> jumped into the icy lake after raising money for oh the Special boy. Olympics throughout the school. Wow, must have been cold. Rotary Club hosted the Winter Formal Dance, which was a few weeks ago, and the students had fun setting up, and the dance was very successful. We also had a pep rally before Winter Formal, which featured a staff versus students basketball game. The staff were victorious by only a few points. And uh, the rally also featured male palms and a balloon drop with cash prizes. Ooh. For the winter season results, boys swimming took third place in the FEA, mm -hmm. girls basketball tied for fourth place, and also during their season beat state qualifiers Kimberly and Hortonville. Boys basketball finished tied for fifth, wrestling finished in eighth, and dance team placed in the top half of the invites, and ice hawks finished in seventh. Spring sport practices are starting up soon for track, baseball, softball, girls soccer, and boys tennis. They're hoping for some warm weather soon. Mm -hmm. We had Sasquatch Days, which was our final spirit week of the year, and had a lot of great participation with that. Sassy the Sasquatch roamed the school and took pictures with lots of students and staff. Sources of Strength organized a 50-50 raffle at a basketball game and raised over $200 for the day-by-day -day warming shelter. North hosted the District Solo Ensemble Festival for several schools in the area, and their singers and instrumentalists performed pieces that we had been preparing for months, and many of them advanced to the state level at UWO. And then North Forensics has been actively participating in meets and their team of dedicated freshmen has had a lot of successes in various categories. Coming up is North Night, a herd game on March 13th, student council elections on March 14th, and then the Hall of Fame and Academic Awards Ceremony on March 15th. Thank you so much. Very nice. Dr. Kurt Wright? Absolutely. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and talk uh, related to the superintendent's good news report. Um, recently, our Community One's students partnered with the American Heart Association to spread awareness on heart disease. Specifically, um, they offered sessions in yoga for stress relief, hands-only CPR, <coughs> hallway exercises, and even healthy snacks. Um, Community Two juniors are embarking on a semester of service projects while the seniors are researching their senior internships. Uh, juniors begin their projects by participating in a project fair where needs from the community come into the classroom for students to learn and identify a cause that they want to work with. Seniors are focused on the future career plans and aspirations. They spend time preparing and researching their intern placement options and hear from the mentors and industry experts. The Webster Stanley Middle School Forensic Team recently received A ratings for their prose and readers theater pieces. They are advancing to the level two competition. After three separate performances, judges rate students on appropriateness of the piece selected, introduction, delivery, handling of the manuscript, and use of time. Great job for these students from Webster School. 
Perry Tipler Middle School and the Alps Charter School recently enjoyed classroom visits from the Leadership Oshkosh participants. The students were able to hear from community leaders and the community leaders were able to learn more about the school and charter classrooms. Being a participant of the Oshkosh um, Leadership Program, I can tell you that the, the comments that people came back to on the debrief of this were, they were very impressed with our students and they were very complimentary and provided a lot of kudos. First grade students at Carl Traeger Elementary School participated in the Wisconsin Golden Archer Awards. This is a chance for students in Wisconsin to review and choose their favorite book. Carl Traeger first graders reviewed five picture books over the past month and each student voted for their favorite. The school community is now patiently waiting to see if his votes match the votes of all of the other students across Wisconsin. <laughs> Student athletes from Oshkosh North and Oshkosh West High School recently competed at the State Wrestling Tournament in Madison. Alec Hunter finished fifth at the 106 and Edgar Heredia finished third at 170. Congratulations to all of these talented student athletes. Jefferson Elementary School recently hosted a Celebrate Us Family Night. The event brought over 100 students, families, and staff together for a night of celebrating the unique talents, diversity, and backgrounds of the entire school community. During the event, families received a passport to explore and take part in many unique experiences, including performances by traditional Hmong dancers, African drumming, art displays, make and take activities, readers theater performances, family photo booth, and so much more. And we just heard a little bit about this, uh, but from the Oshkosh North Sources of Strength student group recently raised over $200 and collected several boxes of warm weather to donate to the day by day warming shelter. The Sources of Strength is a student run organization at Oshkosh North and Oshkosh West whose ultimate goal is to combat sadness, anxiety, and anger in our schools and community by connecting people to hope, help, and strength through campaigns and positive messaging. The Oshkosh Area School District was recently recognized by the Oshkosh Area United Way, being named one of the top five large organizations to receive the Campaign Top Performer Finalist Award. Special thanks and recognition also goes to Al Wing for our, from our recreational department, um, who is the director there, who has organized and um, helped facilitate this campaign for the past 24 years within the district. A great big thank you to the entire Oshkosh Area School District United Way campaign team and to everyone who contributed to this year's campaign. We're continuing to spotlight a few of our teachers and sharing their reflections on why they teach. And so as you can see here, we do have three individuals, and two of them being teachers and one of them being a paraprofessional this, uh, for tonight. We are so grateful to all of these individuals and for everyone throughout the district to support our children on a daily basis. It's only been a week, so it's not as full as normal. <laughs> so as you can see, I'm always committed to building community through education, um, and as superintendent, committed to being present and engaged in our schools and throughout the community. On the screen, you'll see just a few examples of where I've been spending my time for the past week. Thank you very much, Dr. Cartwright. Wonderful report. With that, uh, we'll move on. We do have one district administrator supplemental report. Uh, Dr. Kim Brown had prepared a report on the achievement gap reduction. We asked if she could just give us an executive summary of that so that the board is reminded of what that's about and the public can know as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, so the AGR is the achievement gap reduction report and you might remember that formerly known as SAGE. Um, and I think most of you know it as SAGE, the Student Achievement Guarantees in Education, and that changed in 2015 to the AGR program. Um, but it hasn't changed a whole lot. It still has three strategies that you can choose from in the Oshkosh Area School District. Um, the schools that are utilizing AGR, um, either they, they both have instructional coaching 
and choosing the 18 to 1 classroom size. And so um, those are their strategies that they utilize. And then, of course, you could see in the report um, where they are, each school and their grade levels and where they are. I just want to uh, remind you that that is an attainment score. And so that means the, that is where they are right now to an end of the year goal. We would expect all the kids to be where they need to be by mid-year. So you'll get to see that um, later on this year, their full year, and uh, the principals will be here to present some of the things that they have done this school year. Very good. I always look forward to this report for many reasons. Um, to me, it speaks to equity mm -hmm. in our district, and it also speaks to accountability. And um, it's important that all of our students be given the opportunity to achieve to their highest potential. We all benefit when our students are successful. So thank you, thanks mm -hmm. to you and to the AGR schools as they provided you with information for mm -hmm. this report. Absolutely. Any questions? Comments by anyone? Okay, then moving on, are there Thanks, committee? Thank you. Thank you. Are there other committee uh, reports tonight from the board? I do know there's an education committee meeting tomorrow, so tomorrow we can look forward to that um, report at an upcoming meeting. Is there anyone who would like to speak to the board tonight on a non-agenda related item? Seeing none, is there anyone who would like to speak to the board about an agenda related item? Seeing none, we will move on to the workshops. Adopting new social studies standards. I've also looked forward to this report. So. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> you were a former social studies teacher. I right? was in a prior life. <laughs> in a prior life. Oh. Far away in a Once a teacher, galaxy. always a teacher. <laughs> so we have uh, Mrs. Con Ms. Conrad here tonight and Mrs. Poyer joining us. Well, thank you. So we'll go right into um, we'll go right into the presentation. Um, and once again, I'm Julie Conrad, the director of curriculum and assessment. And I'm Vicki Poyer. For those who do not know me, I am a 25-year veteran of our school district. I have been a high school and middle school social studies teacher, a peer coach for our district, a gifted and talented teacher for our district, and now I'm an instructional support teacher, serving primarily Carl Ma Carl Traeger Middle School. So this fall, uh, a K-12 through social studies task force was put together and it was made up of elementary teachers, middle school teachers, high school teachers, um, literacy coaches, instructional support teachers, library media specialists, um, and they all came together this fall working with Chris McDaniels, who is the social studies consultant from the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. And there we, we tapped into the DPI because there hasn't been new social studies standards to look at for over 20 years. And so this was, this was really, um, we knew this was going to be interesting, meaty um, information to dive into. But we also know we needed a structure for that task force. So as the educators got together, they were given four goals um, to meet as they met with Chris um, McDaniels and then continued on with their meetings. They were asked to establish a defin definition of what a social studies student would look like if they were college, career, and community ready. What we've been doing with all of our content areas when they're meeting to look at standards and what our learning targets would look like within the Oshkosh Area School District, we asked them to define that because that's really what our goal is, is that upon graduation, we want our students to be college, career, and community ready. So the group went through a process, facilitated protocol, and this is the definition um, that they came up with seems like a pretty good definition. And so from there, um, after they came up with the, the definition, they were asked to explore um, the college, career, and civic life framework, and that's the C3 framework, and that was an exhibit that was included in your board packet, because the C3 framework, as we're going to talk about later, is the foundation for a lot of the social study standards that states are developing across the country. We also looked at the new Wisconsin K-12 social study standards, um, and really dove into those. The third goal was to really understand the three-year rollout of standards along with the planned resources to assist districts. The Department of Public Instruction has put together, since new standards have been rolling out, they put together um, a plan to help districts take a look at that. And the last piece was develop our own three-year implementation plan at the K-5, 6, 8, and 9, 12 level. 
So I'm going to speak a little bit about the C3 framework. This is a national document that was published in 2013. It was written collaboratively with a number of stakeholders, including classroom teachers, university professors, state leaders, professional organizations such as the National Council for Social Studies and National Geographic, just, just to name a few. And as Julie alluded to, this really is a foundational document that provides states and, and local districts uh, really a guidepost for um, the, the, the skills and the concepts necessary to create a social studies program that prepares students for college, career, and civic life. So central to the C3 is an inquiry arc. And the inquiry arc really is a different paradigm for teaching <coughs> social studies to our K-12 students, in which students develop questions and plan inquiries around a social or a historical phenomenon, and then investigate that inquiry through a variety of disciplinary lenses, through the lens of uh, an economist, a geographer, a historian, uh, a political scientist. And then, and then throughout that uh, inquiry, students are asked to make claims. They're asked to substantiate those claims with textual evidence, and then to communicate their findings in an authentic way, and finally, take civic action on their findings. Mm -hmm. So as an instructional support teacher in our district, what I'm most excited about with the C3 framework really is its direct connection with our initiatives with English language arts throughout our district and really throughout our state. And using the inquiry arc, social studies taught through this manner really champions many of the initiatives in our district. For example, close reading of text uh, from a variety of complexities research standards, our ITL standards, and finally having students communicate their findings with a wide variety of, me of mediums, digital mediums including writing. Mm -hmm. And so as from a curriculum director's lens or as we start to put this, um, as we start to piece these all together, that inquiry arc leverages three powerful standards with English language arts and those are writing and research standards. Um, our common assessments at the secondary level are anchored in writing to pull that writing across all of our content areas and one of those high leverage standards is something called W9, it's the writing, it's the ninth writing standard that really utilizes taking a text and citing the evidence with it which is a key skill um, in state assessments and, and also in the ACT. Also with this, as we're pulling across this in the shared language, is the information technology literacy standards that are also a great blend and you can see that and it's linked to our um, school improvement goals at our secondary level and our elementary level. So if what I'm most excited about is the connection to English language arts, I would say that our task force members are most excited about the opportunity to have students take informed um, informed civic action mm -hmm. and uh, I'm going to read off my notes for this point because I really don't want to miss anything so we met our last meeting was two weeks ago uh, with our task force and many of our task force members have been uh, experimenting with uh, informed action in their classroom and working closely with their technology integration class uh, integration coaches excuse me to um, to create opportunities for students to, to take action beyond their classroom, beyond classroom debates. And so just some examples, using Flipgrid to create public service announcements, mm -hmm. establishing international grid pals with students in other cities, states, and throughout the nation actually, uh, having students uh, develop newscasts and blogs that are aired outside of the class walls, and actually we have a task force member here with us today who has really uh, championed partnering with global, excuse me, with community organizations and businesses in her classroom. So um, really reaching out, having students contact businesses uh, and having business come back into the classroom as well. So getting back to the, the inquiry arc, dimension two 
really uh, hones in on how do experts conduct inquiry. So how would a historian view a, a particular issue versus a geographer? So for an example, we can take a look at, let's say, the bombing of Pearl Harbor as a uh, historical investigation for a student. How a sociologist would approach that, that inquiry is very different than how a geographer would approach that inquiry. So let's take it through the lens of a geographer. So how did the bombing of Pearl Harbor affect um, the human and physical landscape of Hawaii? What kind of text would a geographer study to gather that mm -hmm. information? They would critically look at maps, uh, charts, uh, soil samples, aerial photography, uh, then and now, uh, to really explore and gather information to make a substantive claim. And how a political scientist would approach that inquiry obviously would be very different. Mm -hmm. And if you're hearing the connections to literacy and the things that we're mm -hmm. doing within science, I do and it gives me chills every time I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so with that, the Wisconsin K-12 Social Studies Standards were adopted by the state legislature, <coughs> um, state legislature um, in the spring. And uh, several Oshkosh area school district staff members, and I'm going to read this off too so I don't uh, forget anybody, were integral in writing of the standards or the supporting appendices that were in the document, and that was also one of your exhibits in there. So first we have um, Vicki Poyer, who's here with us. Uh, she is a she's a member of the Wisconsin Social Studies Task Force, a presenter at the Wisconsin State Standards Council, a lead for the inquiry writing team, a co-facilitator of the CESA 6 rollout workshop. Um, we have Matt Mock. He is a member of the behavioral science team for the writing of the standards. Heather Kangas, a member of the standards-based grading task force. And with us this evening, we have Wanda Kern, one of our elementary teachers here in Oshkosh. And she was a member of the K-5 units of study task force for social studies. So our Oshkosh Area School District um, educators, they have their fingerprints um, all in these oh, new standards so and within the appendices. Did you saw my fingerprint you right saw there? Your fingerprint? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, in this writing and as we were doing this, so we had experts right here um, with us in Oshkosh as we were um, rolling this out and through all of this we were using the C3 framework as our underpinning. So that's why um, when we come to you with a resolution um, two weeks from now, we're not only asking to adopt the Wisconsin K-12 social study standards, we're asking to adopt that framework because we feel that's really supporting mm -hmm. the, um, the purpose behind those standards. So speaking of those standards, these are the 26 anchor standards in learning priority. There's 26 anchor standards within the social study standards, and these go across all the grades K through 12. And underneath there, and that was in the supporting exhibits that you got, are the learning priorities and the grade band performance expectations. Mm -hmm. But the key with this is these standards replace the Wisconsin model academic standards that were put into place in 1998. Oh so that's 20 years that we have been working off our current social studies standards. And for K-5, our social studies curriculum resources are that old as well. And so wow. Wanda's probably shaking her head yes. <laughs> <laughs> that behind us. We have, we have a true need, but we've really been holding off as long as we can, waiting for um, guidance on the social studies, on the social studies wow. standards. So going from social studies standards, which were very fact and concept based, 20 plus years old, to really a new paradigm shift in how to approach mm -hmm. teaching social studies really requires five significant instructional shifts. And our three-year plan for K-5, 6, 8, 9, 12 really accounts for each of these instructional shifts. Mm -hmm. And depending upon the level, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're pretty ex uh, significant. We, we, we spoke to some of them al uh, already. I just want to, uh, to talk briefly about the dynamic balance of skills and content. As we are investigating historical or social phenomenon through the various lenses, we not only are, are steeping students in, in the, the rich standards of inquiry and research, but we're also approaching it through um, the disciplinary lenses in tackling key vocabulary, key strategies, key concepts. Going back to the example I gave earlier of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, 
Obviously, we need to talk about um, the movement of people, places, goods, ideas, which is a key geography concept. So it's a, it's, it's a dynamic balance of both. It's not one or the other. In addition to the instructional mm -hmm. shifts, um, the social studies standards for the first time provide a K-12 progression, a learning progression for social studies. Um, prior to this, there was not vertical alignment between the grade levels when it came to standards in the Wisconsin Model Academic Standards. They were K-5 was written separately from 6-8, was written separately from 9-12. This is a shift, and these are really representing um, a progression. And it's been a priority, and it needs to be a priority that we're focusing on K-5 when it comes to social studies because that th social studies has been um, uh, I, I, Jan, just, I was actually yes. at a meeting with um, Jan now Brady. Governor Evers but mm -hmm. at that time State Superintendent Dr. Evers and mm -hmm. um, we were sitting across the table from one another having a conversation mm -hmm. about our social studies standards and we likened the analogy to Jan of the Brady Bunch so social <laughs> studies is Jan mm -hmm. Well, you know, in literacy and math, it's been Marsha, 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 Marsha. So with this, um, and like I alluded to before, the DPI has a three-year uh, rollout plan. Um, you're going to notice the color coding is going to look very similar to science because this is the approach we're taking across the state when rolling out um, any type of content standards. So drum roll, specifically the work from the K-12 Social Studies Task Force is represented up here. So here is the K-5 plan that is also um, included in your board packet. Each one of the plans starts with phase one, which is that awareness and understanding. That's in the year we are now. Um, phase two is bridging into the new standards. So um, once we have board approval that these can be adopted, we can move forward into that next phase. And then teaching and assessing to um, the social study standards. And once again, you're going to see it a very similar role interface um, from uh, science. Um, these are the this is the six eight rollout plan that was in um, mm -hmm. your packet, along with the nine twelve rollout plan. And you're going to see a lot of similarities, but you're also going to see some differences because it's really based on the needs of each of the the levels. And the the detail that you're going to see, I, I really feel that the complexity is really going to come in with K five, mm -hmm. um, and we're going to really need to pay attention to that because. Our elementary teachers are going to need a lot of support. There is a lot on their plate. There is a lot on the elementary right. students' plate. So we're going to have to be very purposeful and intentional how we support our classroom teachers um, going um, going through this with the rollout. And um, and we know we have some other things coming with that. So speaking of rollout and alignment, um, this is aligned to our current strategic plan. I'm going to predict that um, there's going to be some type of alignment with our next strategic plan because we all are all about um, teaching and learning. Um, we know that a cr we're anticipating with the social studies um, new adoption, there will be coming down the road um, a curriculum adoption. Um, and if you remember from science, approximately we budget 375000 per um, per at a level like K5, 6, 8, 9, 12 when it comes to that. Um, we will have a phase in plan. Um, 6, 8, and 9, 12 were previously adopted two years ago, if you remember that. Mm -hmm. um, K5, once again, we held on that. So K5 is absolutely going to be um, our priority. Mm -hmm. um, we're not anticipating huge, ad um, huge adoption or shifts for 6, 8, or 9, 12. And with that, we're also going to be, with that adoption, ha asking to take a look at staffing because there really needs to be leadership and coordination within, the, within this implementation. And so if you recall, like with science and with STEM, you, we really need somebody with expertise at the helm mm -hmm. as we start to um, start to roll this out because there is going to be a lot of planning to do this and do this in a way that we are incorporating and leveraging those key literacy standards. So that leads us into our last slide for the evening. And um, this is a pretty, I felt like this was a really powerful um, infographic from the Chief Council of State, um, state School officers, officers, right? School officers, thank you. Um, I was trying to do that one off the top of my head. Um, and so as we look at this, we've been, we've been talking about equity a lot. And we're going to continue to hear us um, here in our school district and as educators talking about equity having social studies and making sure that it's not a marginalized content area mm -hmm. is a key to me a key equity issue mm -hmm. and I know Vicki you had one other point that you wanted to put on throughout the state throughout the nation 
throughout the state specifically, social studies minutes have been cut drastically to the point where many schools no longer have K-5 social studies education. Uh, truth mm -hmm. um, throughout our state. Uh, within, uh, within our own school district, our teachers have been without materials mm -hmm. for many years mm -hmm. in teaching social studies. It's not taught consistently. It's not taught on a daily basis. In many places, it's not taught on a weekly basis. And so really, as we move forward, uh, mm -hmm. I think about my own children. I have two children who are now graduated from our school district. And in our family, we took them to museums. Mm -hmm. We took them on trips. We read widely. We traveled. We provided all of those out-of-school experiences that really augmented their social studies education. Not all children have those advantages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we really want to bring, bring all of those learnings into our classroom for all of our students. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So on that note, questions and conversations. Great presentation. Any comments or questions? Well, your enthusiasm is contagious. Yeah. Oh, yes, I, I know, right? School. <laughs> I want to do this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. This yes. is something Exciting. I've been involved with for probably oh, nine years. Yeah, yeah I can so yeah. we've been we've been waiting for these to come out. So yeah. I'm very excited. <laughs> I got chills too, Julie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know it's awesome. Yeah. Um, this is such a, a very well to me very significant but it's uh, the whole gist of the the presentation the whole thought of all of this this is a small little thing but when I was reading through this and I read the line um, it's no longer realistic to require students to memorize everything yes. mm -hmm. it was like a hallelujah <laughs> like mm -hmm. yeah there my That's kids scream this in my ear yeah. all the time you know I have three of them and they're like mom I will never have to memorize anything mm -hmm. when will I not have a computer when will I never have a calculator? Right. This is ridiculous. So like it's so just to hear that, you know, that their the education, the academic out there is finally uh, like catching this is twenty up. years old, catching it's up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not about memorizing those dates. We don't need to do that ever again. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have to pick up and go to the library and walk 20 hours to get there, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you know, my parents said when they were kids right. to get this information no, anymore. It's right here. Yeah, it's right here. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, they, you can up their skill set, which is taking this into literacy and all of those mm -hmm. other things. And aligning mm -hmm. this with the science is awesome, awesome. Because as a parent, I wouldn't have to listen to the complaining again because they've mm -hmm. already done it with science, so now they're going to do it with social studies. Mm -hmm. You know, where, Mom, it's so different. And I'm like, yeah, I know. It's awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's great. Yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah. Mr. Peschel. Sure. Um, first, I want to say that my favorite subject in <laughs> elementary school was social studies. Oh, good for you. My too. So <laughs> I enjoyed memorizing everything. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I really did. So kids, Can we like quiz you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not anymore. <laughs> Many years ago, you could have, but I, I enjoyed it, um, and I and I really, um, and I, I, I have a lot of hope that this can rejuvenate yeah. love and social mm -hmm. studies. I almost said social media. Um, <laughs> I don't That's love fair. social media, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but and it's partially because of that. You know, I want the next generation to be excited about learning about this right. stuff because. Mm -hmm. This is the stuff that drove me to be an active citizen in my mm -hmm. community, learning and understanding Absolutely. this stuff um, and utilizing some of this stuff, the history that you learn and the impact of communities through everything that was learned in social studies is such an integral part mm -hmm. of being involved in our communities. Mm -hmm. um, and, and my hope is that, is that the next generation that, that gets this, gets engaged with this, understands that. and learns to not have to, you know, understands that need of not have to mm -hmm. memorize everything and understand the efficiency of yeah. that. Yeah. And to be able to utilize that to improve yeah. our communities. Mm -hmm. yeah. So awesome. thank you yeah. for that. I think this is great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Thank you, Mr. Peschel. I would just like to make a, a few comments. I'm, I'm really very happy to see these dimensions <laughs> under the inquiry mm -hmm. arc. Um, we live in a world that is so different from the one I grew up in mm -hmm. where we depended on a couple of TV stations out of Green Bay, maybe a couple out of Milwaukee at one point, um, and a daily newspaper and the proliferation of where people get their information mm -hmm. from 
um, where they get their facts from is so different and so um, bountiful as compared to what, what I grew up with. It's also so important as we talk about college career and community ready. To me, this is speaking about skills for a lifetime. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Being able to develop questions and plan inquiries, uh, gathering and evaluate sources, develop claims and using evidence, yep. communicating and critiquing conclusions, um, taking informed action. Um, I have a sister and a brother-in-law who both were very active in debate and it's <laughs> very interesting getting together with them because they do this on a very high scale. Um, and and they challenge me in a positive way to support statements I make and claims that I make or, mm -hmm. or evidence that I think I'm providing. Um, but that's a good thing. I also have had the opportunity over the last several years to, to um, be involved on a civic level as a poll worker. And that mm -hmm. has been fascinating in terms of people coming sure. to the polls knowing clearly are appearing to know who they want to vote for or what they want to vote for as compared to people coming and saying, oh, I didn't know there was a, a, <laughs> a question on the ballot to change the state constitution. What does this mean? Or, well, I always vote the way my husband votes, um, which is maybe okay, but I'm not sure that they're applying this, this inquiry arc. Um, we've had people who have come to the polls and they're not really sure what they're voting for. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that we can we can change that in this community to have voters who are mm -hmm. more informed. That's critical to a mm -hmm. democracy to Absolutely. have uh, voters who are well informed. Um, I also see implications in terms of teacher licensure. PI 34 came out mm -hmm. um, last year. There have been a number of changes related to teacher licensure over the years. And as you were speaking, I was reflecting on the expectations we have on our elementary teachers because we expect them to teach everything. We expect them to teach all the disciplines. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, we often describe them as generalists. They don't have um, deep uh, preparation in all of the content areas, but we expect them to be able to answer questions, to do this, do the what's expected in science, literacy, and, and so on. There are changes that, that will impact this at the secondary level mm -hmm. uh, in that, um, just be aware, there are changes coming at the yeah. secondary lev level for social studies people yeah. where they uh, may not have this broad background that those of us who had broad field social studies <laughs> majors had. Mm -hmm. Not that we have to preserve everything we did years <laughs> ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least um, when you talk about the various disciplines and the social studies and looking at things through the lens of an economist or, or a mm -hmm. geographer, it's good to know something about that background in order to do that. So mm -hmm. um, there's some, some interesting challenges in, in the fact that we have materials that are mm -hmm. 20 years old, if we have materials. Uh, and the fact that we don't have materials to teach, mm -hmm. that's a real challenge because, again, there is so much on the plate of those elementary mm -hmm. teachers in particular to, to have to create materials or, mm -hmm. or find materials mm -hmm. now in order to do this will be um, quite a challenge mm -hmm. with all the other things they're expected to do, mm -hmm. like yes. indoor recess on cold mm -hmm. winter days and, mm -hmm. and a few other things. So um, I really look forward to this. I think that this holds great potential to help us with the mm -hmm. three C's of college, career, and community ready. And um, I'm very excited about this. So thank you for- You're welcome. For the mm -hmm. work and the leadership at the state level to Wanda and to Vicki and to Mr. Mock. Yep, and Matt Mock and Heather Tingas. And Heather. Mm -hmm. awesome. And uh, to all of you for leading the charge here in the district. This, mm -hmm. th this to me is quite exciting, so thank you. Mm -hmm. right. thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving on then, another workshop I've been looking forward to is the facilities and enrollment projections with Bray, uh, Mrs. Schnorr, and Mr. Fox. <coughs> Someone was thinking donuts were coming in tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah. It is Ash Wednesday, so maybe we can get Probably it's better it. not to have donuts today. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's something in the break room. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, she did. Oh, good. Is this the whole, everything that was provided to us? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Uh, well, good evening. It's uh, good to be back with you uh, again. Um, I think the last time we were, I was here was September or October. 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 It was October. Thank you. Um, so, um, so we wanted to kind of, uh, I guess, reset things a little bit. Again, we took a little bit of a pause in this, and so we just kind of wanted to recap um, where we are to date and really set the table uh, moving forward um, in this process. Uh, again, so kind of a, a little bit of this as a reminder, and then kind of uh, there, there's a little bit of uh, some, some new information in this as well. Um, again, the study process that we went uh, through to date um, uh, was really a deep dive into your existing facilities on a number of different fronts. Um, there was our architectural and site analysis, um, going through the buildings with our uh, internal teams, uh, going through existing building drawings and information we had there. Uh, we brought uh, engineering teams through the buildings to review plumbing, um, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and electrical needs um, for all of the facilities. Um, American with Disabilities Act, we looked at the buildings in terms of how they perform uh, to code um, for all of the um, accessibility standards uh, in the current code. Again, kind of a, an important note in that is, is uh, the question we always get is what is, what is grandfathered, what is not grandfathered. Um, for the most part, again, the, the building is, uh, for, for our purposes, the building is code compliant if it was built under the, the code at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but when we make modifications going forward, we obviously want to bring things up to date um, as we move forward. Um, if, uh, if there's a building without a uh, handicap accessible toilet, for example, that's something we, we probably want to you know, put a little bit higher up on the, on the, on the burner, so to speak. Um, and then obviously a lot of communication, um, talking to uh, Jim and his staff as we were going through the buildings to, mm -hmm. to learn more, because a lot of um, what is valuable in this process is really the institutional knowledge that you can't find on a paper anywhere. So again, we want to make sure that um, that gets documented throughout the process. Again, the facility study had uh, a lot of information in it. Um, uh, I forget how many pages it was, <laughs> but uh, it was a very lengthy document. Um, and this is kind of a nice, this slide kind of uh, is a nice uh, summation of the different sections that were included in it, which again kind of encapsulates the, the work of the four points um, in the previous slide. So building evolution diagram. Um, this is a, a, a really cool diagram that um, most districts don't have. It, it really documents the vintage of each sec section of the building. Um, so when it was originally built, when um, the really primarily when the additions were put onto the buildings, um, a, a really nice document to kind of understand. Uh, most districts don't have kind of something that encapsulates that. Um, existing site plan, um, I think what's unique about this is just understanding the, the um, GIS or the property information um, with, within each of the buildings. Um, existing floor plans, again, kind of um, calling together all of the, the separate documents you have, but, but creating a, um, a snapshot in time of what the current plans are for the buildings. Um, again, the building system summary, which is a um, the reports from the en engineers and a summarization of that. Uh, needs assessment, again, the critical thing to pinpoint with the needs assessment, it's really just the, what, what, what we need to, to help fix the buildings, right? So we're not talking needs assessment in terms of we need another classroom or the room needs to be larger <laughs> or we, we need new components within the room. Again, this is trying to fix what we have, fix, fixing walls, floors, ceilings, um, those types of items. Uh, site summary, again, um, understanding some of the issues um, with, with regard to drainage and topography and pavement conditions. 
Um, the ADA, assess ADA uh, needs assessment, again, um, there was some graphic documentation for to support that in, in addition to the narrative. Uh, the roof analysis uh, and understanding, again, kind of bringing together a large piece of information the district does have to kind of one document to um, understand the, the vintage and roofing needs for the facilities. And then exterior doors and windows, again, understanding the needs um, that we have throughout the, the Can I interrupt district. Can a quick question? Absolutely. So between these two, the needs assessment and the site summary, mm -hmm. uh, when I look at these and what's in there, I'm kind of getting the feeling that like the needs assessment is more of the indoor stuff and then the site summary is that the outdoor stuff? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Correct. Yep. So uh, again, I touched on a little bit of this, but we just want to again maybe very, very clearly kind of identify the kind of the work at, that was part of this, what it, what it was not. So again, um, that the top one I think is really the most, <coughs> one of the more critical ones that it's not about uh, analysis of the quantity, size, or quality of the educational spaces. It's really going to, again, conditions and um, facility needs for the buildings. Um, it wasn't an exploration of solutions. Um, it wasn't an evaluation of educational capacity. Um, and it's not an, an estimate or approximation of how long the systems um, will continue to, to go. Again, there's, there's recommendations for best practices based on the, the length of period of time. Again, we know, uh, you know a, a boiler can last much longer than, than maybe a, the prescribed amount of time we, we think it can. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there's generally um, rules of thumb in terms of the industry of when you should look to replace those types of um, equipment. Um, it was not a prioritization or, or, or again, or a recommendation. Um, and it was not a uh, projection of, of kind of how the, uh, it was of the cost of that. And, and again, we'll, we'll get to that because that, that, um, that came a little bit later in the process. Um, so I wanted to touch on district enrollment and projections. So as part of this process, the district did um, work with uh, the UW um, Wisconsin Applied Population Lab. Um, to evaluate um, potential uh, future enrollments for the district. Um, again, this was, um, we also then created a document that summarized kind of the history as well as led into the projections. So the history um, for the district came from a, a study and a report in, that was done internally on May um, 2018. Uh, We've also added enrollment numbers um, since then from the January 11th um, uh, counts within the schools. And again, kind of an important part to include here is that this is resident only. This doesn't factor in um, open enrollment numbers. And then um, I did want to kind of touch on the points. So the UW-Wisconsin um, Applied Population Lab is um, they use kind of a, a number of, of different factors in what they're trying to determine. They're listed up here, the birth and kindergarten enrollment trends, population estimates, um, and area housing starts. So they're, they're kind of using, I think, uh, you know, data um, in terms of trends and that type of thing. Um, the, the final point there, that this does not offer a detailed analysis of potential growth or the potential for development within surrounding communities. So at the time of the population uh, study that was done, there's sort of two different ways you can go with that. There is the applied population um, lab study that uh, many, many districts use throughout the state, and it's a great process to go through it. Um, there is another company that's um, started to do these um, more regularly for school district. They're, the company is called MD Roffers. Um, they do a little bit deeper dive um, process through this. They work with uh, local municipalities and developers and kind of un try to understand um, really, I think, a little bit more what's happening in the district, um, more so than, than kind of the, just the pure data-driven um, analysis of the enrollment. Um, so that, that study um, was, the, the district did not go forward with that study, um, but we just kind of wanted to point out to the board that that, that, that <coughs> is something you could consider um, should you want to, again, take kind of a deeper dive into the, the analysis. I have a question. So when we did this study, I know we have the new numbers from 2018-19. Mm -hmm. And so this is for enrollment or projection, and we don't know the implication yet of um, whether or not, so this does not include um, Oshkosh Truck's new 
headquarters, correct? And, and what kind of business that will bring in? Does that include this at all yet? No. No, no it does not. Or the arena or so kind of like that. I'd, I don't personally obviously have any idea how that will affect our community and affect our numbers, but those aren't in here, that they don't Correct. include those kind of Correct. things, those huge economic growths? Correct. Okay. Again, that I think the, the MD Roffers study would, yeah. would, would have a little bit more detailed analysis in that. They actually if break, we they break up uh, a community into um, areas and they kind of okay. look at the develop the developability and kind of evolution of each of those areas okay. um, over time. They mm -hmm. talk to developers, they talk to the municipalities to kind of understand, I think, uh, in a little bit more detail what's what's being um, done. So that would be one of our next steps that we it, could, it could go be, for? Yes. Okay. There is a significant you. price difference yes. <laughs> between the enrollment right. study that Absol we right. did yes. and the one that, yep. that Clint is talking about. There was yep. a significant price okay. difference. And so at this stage in the game, yes. we went with the less expensive um, option. Yeah, maybe that's something we could look at. Yeah. Also yeah. to take into consideration, um, for example, where we know with Oshkosh Corp, where there's approximately, I believe, 500 um, people that they're looking to bring on board um, within, the within the next right. year to two years, yeah. um, which could potentially be 500 families. Mm -hmm. So even with the other report that comes in there, it could poten it could look at that but it's making an assumption that those families are not going to open enroll out of the district, district. Right. and okay. or yeah. that those families do reside within the district, yeah. uh, which is a part of that, that conversation as well, especially okay. when we yeah. know um, how much school districts are economic, div um, economic drivers within mm -hmm. communities. Right. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, just the outside look of, outside of the outside of our facilities is a driver of that too, mm -hmm. as right, to whether or not right. families decide if they want to say yes. Yes, mm -hmm. I've heard that a lot. Mm -hmm. this, Thank you. Yep. This relates back for me to the social studies conversation that we just <laughs> had. How does a geographer look at this? And how does a <coughs> sociologist look at this? Mm -hmm. And the, the questions that are posed and gathering the evidence mm -hmm. and forming conclusions and so on. So I, I see a real life application going on here between <laughs> heard about in terms of the social studies, which we've not all studied yet, and uh, this, this report. So kudos to those who planned tonight's agenda. Mm -hmm. so Thank you. Oh, sorry. Did you have anything else? No, I, was, I, I just had a quick, I didn't know if they were, how that intertwined in here or didn't. So that was my only question. So question. then. Thank you. I, I guess my, my question is that there's a suggestion that we're going to have a continual decline in enrollment based on these numbers. That correct. That yeah, correct. correct. That, that was kind of the, uh, I, I mean, and again, with a, the district as large as you are, well, well, 300 seems like, a, I think, a big number to a, more people. I, we would probably say it's a sort of, we, the trend would be sort of steady to slight decline. But yes, mm -hmm. to your point, yes, the, the based on the numbers from the apl applied population, um, they, they would they would see the decline. Um, let me, slight, uh, just to. Yeah, a, yeah a, but with our, like you said, with our numbers, yeah. that's slight. That's yeah. Um, just a quick, just a quick po point. Um, we we worked up in the West De Pierce School District, and we they did the same process. They they um, hired applied population. Uh, applied population came back with what they thought were crazy growth numbers. Again, West De Pierce is growing rapidly, sure. right? And what we did was we used the uh, MD Roffers report in their case to validate that number because it's scary to build to the growth that they were they were seeing. Right. Um, so it, it, again, in this case, it, should the district go through with this, I think again it would be a more of a validation process okay. and 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 maybe just trying to to see if the if if some of the recent development really will have a big spur on on what enrollment could be. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Um, so within your, your document, there's actually two pages um, of the kind of that enrollment. So the, the one is that the one that's included in on the presentation here, which maybe is a, a bit fuzzy on the, the printout just due, due to the, um, and then I did print it out kind of a, hopefully a cleaner. Oh, so they're identical? Yes. Oh, hopefully okay, a little you. bit cleaner, crisper version of that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, Again, so um, as we mentioned earlier, that initial um, facility study was not uh, an analysis of uh, educational capacity. Um, so we have done some preliminary um, capacity calculations for the building as part of, of, of this study as we've kind of continued this process. So we wanted to just uh, introduce this to the board tonight and discuss kind of the methodology and, and theory behind this. 
Um, ca capacity is, is based on a number of factors. Again, number of classes per grade level, um, number of tracks within a school. Again, some schools might just have you know one first grade classroom, others might have three. So again, we want to work through what the model is for each uh, building. Um, really, the critical one is the number of students per class or class size. Again, we this is a this isn't a building capacity analysis, this is educational capacity analysis. So we want to understand what the goal is for the district in terms of um, teacher to student relationship and how many students. Um, I don't need to describe the achievement gap reduction much here. That's that that was uh, discussed earlier, but again, that's the program to have um, to bring that number down within schools. So you have a number of schools within the district that utilize that program, and we wanted to make sure the capacity recognizes that. And then um, the utilization for spaces, um, and I'll, I'll kind of touch on that a little bit more, but um, elementary is a little bit easier calculation. Again, the kids kind of are in their homeroom for the most part, so you analyze the educational capacity of the building based on the number of classrooms. <coughs> um, in high schools and middle schools, it's really more of a schedule-driven process, so the, the calculation is, is a much different animal, so to speak, because you're kind of weighing the entire building in that particular place. Yeah, I have some questions on that one. So again, just kind of quickly going through what, what this is not. Again, this is not size, uh, quality uh, of educational spaces. So we're purely saying if, if it's currently being used as a classroom, we're sort of making a little bit of an assumption here that, that the, 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 the room or the space is being utilized for that can hold the number of students that um, we're saying as a benchmark or a target for class sizes. Um, this is not building capacity. So when I say that is, um, uh, you know, how many people, like I'll, I'll use the gym for example, how many people, you? because we always see the, the gym capacity label on the wall, but um, this isn't how many people you can put in the building um, per code, this is how many people we think um, we would like to target to educate within the buildings. Um, it's not an exact science, and what I mean by that is um, if you were to take the um, class enrollment or the, the target class sizes and just shift those numbers slightly, so instead of 27 students per class, take it up to 30 or down. Um, again, given the size of that district, that's gonna swing the numbers really drastically. So, um, you know, there, there's some there's some level of massaging here as, as we go through. Um, likewise, if you have suddenly have 28 students, uh, does, do you suddenly need another classroom? Well, well no, you're, you're gonna accommodate that, uh, you know, to, to meet what your, your building can, can handle. Um, Again, this is an estimate or approximation of, uh, or is not an estimation or approximation of space needed um, to educate students. So again, um, kind of getting back to some of the peripheral spaces, this isn't um, uh, like special education, this isn't adjusting that we're um, maybe utilizing a closet or a storage room or a room that was intended to be a storage room or a closet for, for some um, programs and spaces because again, the, the space is just not available. And then um, it's not an analysis of the most efficient configuration. Again, we'll, we'll kind of get through that and get to that eventually through this process. So again, uh, uh, some, some kind of chart information. Again, this is that, this is, uh, you know, the key word here is targeted class sizes. So again, working with the district, there's um, kind of two different columns to consider. There's the kind of just the, the general class size, gu uh, class size guideline range, and then the AGR or that reduced. And the AGR goes through third grade. So again, we use this kind of benchmark um, where 24 students up to third grade and then 27 above for a uh, non-AGR program school and then uh, the AGR elementaries are 18 up till third grade. So again, this, this is really kind of the, 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 the magic, so to speak, of this is again, if we swing these numbers one way or another, it really does impact that overall um, swing in things. Uh, I alluded to I alluded to this slide a bit earlier. Um, so again, the, the methodology for this is elementary schools. Really, capacity is kind of that I'll, I call it because that's what I use. But that homeroom mentality. So we're kind of counting, you know, first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade classrooms, and really determining the capacity on the number of, of classrooms we have. Um, art, music classrooms, uh, special education, gymnasiums, those rooms are not calculated in, in this analysis because again, the students primarily sort of start their day in one space and then might go to those spaces intermittently throughout a, a week or, or once, a, once a day, um, so to speak. So this, th those spaces really aren't calculated in the educational capacity. 
High schools, middle schools are uh, very much different. Uh, again, it's a, it's a schedule driven process. Um, and um, um, so we looked at, and, and, and it's kind of a, it's, it's schedule uh, driven and it's also kind of a bit ideological in that we're utilizing this to sort of the maximum efficiency of, of the space, so to speak as well. Because, um, so what, what we're looking at is again, the core classrooms in this particular case, so math, English, social studies and science, um, we're, we're calculating at a factor of the rooms being used six out of seven periods per day. So factoring in, there's usually a prep period for, for most classrooms. And then the elective um, or encore type classes, um, music, art, foreign language, physical education are being, we, we used a factor of um, five out of seven periods of day. Um, but again, recognizing you might have um, some rooms that maybe are only used once or twice per, per day given you know maybe the specialization of the of the room so again this this does kind of have a bit of a optimal nature to it um, so again the numbers could 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 sway depending on how you factor in that utilization number mm -hmm. so this is there's a, a lot more data and, and charts and stuff kind of getting for, for each of the schools to support this but this was kind of the um, the overall uh, numbers that that um, we come up with and again we're using what we um, at the time when we did this and a little it was before we had the 1819 uh, numbers so we're still utilizing the 1718 numbers in here um, for each of, of, of the buildings you can see again that target uh, capacity that we we um, think the buildings could be utilized at uh, the enrollment and then um, the projection through of, of over or under capacity for the buildings I have a question. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Dr. Grant, you might be able to answer this or administration team. What is, I know that these numbers are not done on educational capacity, but is there like, I remember discussing this sometime with something we did where there is a percentage of a school at capacity that is educational healthy environment. It was like, if I can remember, it was like 80%, 85%, like you don't want to go over that for capacity because right. then your, your area becomes, mm -hmm. you know, then you've got kids, you're shifting coming. Is that, am I making that up? Is that no. a... Um, so just for clarification, actually, that's why I was going to uh, oh, stop us on this you. just for a brief okay. moment. Typically, you want to have your capacity at about 85%. And the reason you want to have the 85% okay. is that's because it gives you that flexibility. Um, so when you have... Um, maybe where you have like you need have a, a need for a room for like maybe providing specialized services mm -hmm. or for intervention services okay. um, to where it's not a typical class size mm -hmm. okay. instead it's a, it's a smaller class size but having that 15% flexibility it gives you that flexibility in which to accommodate those educational mm -hmm. needs okay. the other thing I think is important um, I want to highlight so I'm backing just a little bit on this as well is when he was talking about what this study is not and you know the configurations and such so for example mm -hmm. right now in our schools uh, especially our elementary schools where uh, the gymnasiums are being used as the cafeteria mm -hmm. at the same time mm -hmm. it doesn't take that into consideration mm -hmm. right. um, which is right. really right. really important mm -hmm. because so what do you do with class you, well obviously you can't schedule class during lunch time right. for the gym and then really counting on people to push through and some of mm -hmm. our gyms are incredibly small, Very small. Um, and then so how do you push uh, students through you know to have reasonable yeah. lunch periods mm -hmm. so that's yeah. just an yeah, example yeah we get that a lot okay. uh, but again okay. the 85% is really reflecting in on some of the unique needs um, that it gives you the flexibility to ensure that you're mm -hmm. serving the, the educational needs of the population rather than the um, just looking at it from a strict capacity mm -hmm. um, viewpoint right thank you okay I think another thing to to consider here is that a public law 94 142 came into play in 1972 which provided for special education services and we have a number of buildings that were built before 1972 so mm -hmm. they were not designed for special education right. classrooms for OTPT for uh, school uh, social workers psychologists guidance counselors counselors rather so the use of these buildings has has 
changed, evolved over time from what it was when they were originally built. And so find, trying to find spaces for those specialized areas is a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I know you've been talking about the, basically the, curri the curriculum areas, and those are, they're, those are important, but I don't think we can lose sight of the other areas that um, our schools have been asked mm -hmm. to take on, providing for a, yeah. a school resource officer. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> that was something that mm -hmm. for some of us didn't exist when we were right. uh, elementary or even high school students. Mm -hmm. And so this, the, there's greater demand for the space at each of our buildings mm -hmm. than many of them were designed for or mm -hmm. even dreamed about when they, right. were, when they were created. It's, uh, when we go through this process, one of the first things when we meet with staff is, well, what do you, what do you need? And they all say, we need storage. And, mm -hmm. and, and why do they need storage? Because the spaces that were designed as storage are probably being used for educational purposes mm -hmm. at this time. You know, we've, we've, you know that there's been that trickle down to, to try to satisfy exactly what you said, that buildings that were not meant to do certain things or didn't have space to accommodate certain things, mm -hmm. we had to figure out ways <laughs> to make them accommodate those. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're absolutely right. Yeah, that that, that has not been identified um, here as well. Mm -hmm. Again, that kind of gets to the going forward process a little bit. Absolutely. Thank you. I want to ask Mr. Peschel. just a question because I'm just trying to do some math over here, and that's tough for me. So, <laughs> um, the I'm just looking at the at that capacity chart that you provided us, mm -hmm. and. Um, the target capacity column, how is that broken down? Like, how do we get to that number? Like, MLN Cook is 300. Mm -hmm. So is that Five. based on, is that based on the, the 27 per classroom? Or the, if it's an AGR, is it, is it the 18 per classroom? And then we add all that up? Yeah, I was, uh, I, I didn't want to get too far into the weeds here, but I'll kind of show you the, the, the I'll let you come out of the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> I, broke, I broke the projector. Uh oh. I just closed out of the. Did it turn off? No, no it's still on. <laughs> There's a light. It's on. There's a light. <laughs> <laughs> Dave's touch. You don't even have to. Like he just has to be in the vicinity. The computer whisper. Yeah. There you go. It happened to me if you see it did. Uh huh. So, um, so for each of the schools, we, we did we did this. Um, there's also a, um, some colored floor plans. I, I don't have those tonight as well. But we, we went through. So this just for example, this is South Park. So um, <coughs> for the analysis of of, of this. Um, as I mentioned, we, we did a utilization rate. So we, we factored in, again, all the classrooms here are the rooms that were core classrooms as well as science. Um, the utilization rate, again, was that percentage of um, six out of periods per day. Mm -hmm. So you get to the, a calculated capacity per grade, per classroom that's less than that target. So oh. again, we're trying to, oh, we're trying okay. to factor in yep. or calculate that those rooms are not being yep. utilized every period of the day. Okay. Um, for the elective rooms, so choir, uh, orchestra, band, tech ed, um, art, um, family consumer ed, uh, there's, a, there's a different utilization rate that we're cal calculating mm -hmm. here. So again, we're trying to, there, there's, there's again, like so for family consumer ed, for example, that room might not be currently being used at, at five out of seven periods per day. It might be one or two or three, you know, I mean, it, it might be much different. So again, that, that kind of speaks to that the, the frame of mind that you have to think of how uh, and maybe more of an ideal scenario that we're trying to get here a little bit um, versus kind of how it's currently being used. So there's, and again, that's the magic of this too, because you can say, well, that's, that's given that the, the size of that building, that's the most we're ever going to use that space. And we can, you know, we can change the numbers to reflect. Oh, sure. okay. Okay. So I appreciate you diving a little bit deeper on that because that answered a couple of my other questions. So, so thank you for doing that. I would just like to weigh in here on, on uh, what some people may be questioning. Why don't we use those building or why don't we use those classrooms 100 percent of the time? To me, that's a productivity issue for a classroom teacher. If you're a secondary teacher, 
and your your classroom is scheduled every hour of the day, you probably have to vacate that mm -hmm. for one or more periods. And remembering everything you need to take with you and then finding a place to go to do your work mm -hmm. doesn't mean you're making the best use of that professional's time in terms right. of preparation and planning and right. and so on. So it becomes a productivity issue for many of our staff if they have to travel or uh, some teachers in prior years have had to be on what they call carts. So th everything goes right. on a cart and they move room to room to room. Right. That's not necessarily providing equitable no. educational opportunities for children when they have to move in that way because they don't have the opportunity to set up learning activities for all children. So many children then may miss out on rich instructional experiences as a result of that. So. Mm -hmm. Having uh, plans for using a, a classroom six out of seven or five out of seven periods makes a lot of sense yeah. to me. Dr. Right. Kerwin. I was just going to um, echo what you were talking about. And in addition to that, it also takes away op natural opportunities. So if a teacher, um, for example, a student wants to come by and maybe get some additional assistance mm -hmm. on some, some concept that they're learning in the class, if the teacher's having to vacate that room, um, now it's where are you going to provide that and, and what resources are you going to need that oftentimes are, are there. I equate it oftentimes as to um, going to work. You know, when you're, when you're going to work, you have an office, you know what to expect mm -hmm. and, and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, however, if you, if you have a different line of work, um, maybe a salesman or something like that, you're having to keep everything inside your car mm -hmm. potentially <laughs> and go from place to place and, and pull out what you need um, and maybe that's not a good analogy but it, it kind of just helps people frame it maybe a little bit better um, mm -hmm. is having a stable place I know where I'm going every, every day and people know how to find me they may know how to locate me mm -hmm. so on and so forth versus where is she today mm -hmm. or where is he today or where is um, she this hour right right thank you mm -hmm. One other question. So, and I, and I think my question actually comes down to equity. So let's just kind of just roll with this one a little bit here. So, so and part of this is I'm going to ask questions because I don't know the answers to them, and I'm not I'm not a I don't know all this stuff, so I ask. So, our AGR schools are they? Do we believe that they're going to stay AGR schools for their lifetime, or do we expect them to change and? Are they always going to be in AGR school? I think a lot of that is going to be dependent on, uh, upon multiple factors uh, because that is a grant um, okay. that, that we, we apply for. Um, oftentimes it's also based um, clarification here, Dr. Brown, just to make sure I'm accurate on this. Um, for AGR schools, just want to make sure I'm accurate on this. It is a grant funded program in addition to that. Um, it's based off of it. It's not necessarily based off of how the school's performing, though, but it is about the free and reduced lunch rate uh, okay. for the school, the economic uh, so disadvantage, the percent of students on that. My question really comes down to, let's say, in hypothetically, in a great world, all of this changes, and we have, um, you know, we our our, our schools improve. Uh, the economy improves, families' lives improve, and we have less of, of those families that are, you know, um, I can't think of the right word, but, uh, but let's say that that changes, mm -hmm. and we've built this plan upon those schools being AGR schools. Um, does that change the, the equity of, of how we've looked at how these schools are being rated through this. I mean, do we come down later on the line and, and correct that and do another, you know, uh, you know, review of, of that? Does <coughs> do you understand? No, that, that makes sense. Because I, I'd like to believe that our community is going to improve and that our families are going to become more stable and that there's going to be less, uh, you know, uh, that our kids are going to reduce, are going to rely less on us to provide that and that their families are going to do all this and, and mm -hmm. you know so so do we plan for something like that and if we don't how do we accommodate i guess that's where i'm going i think that. some of the if i may to sure. answer your to address your question some of it is factors for which we can't predict right okay. now 
Uh, we don't depend it upon the actions of the board and the direction um, that you choose to take. Uh, we'll kind of drive some of the answers to those questions as well. Um, because remember, because what we're looking at basically is the socioeconomic um, factors uh, within, within the communities and how that um, impacts the school makeup. Yeah, you know, who's mm -hmm. you know, and and how that school is serving the community for which it is located within. Mm -hmm. um, so your tar your capacity that is up there uh, to, to clarify, yes, can shift based upon if the how the calculations were conducted sure. causes a shift. So, for example, Washington. AGR school no longer is an AGR school, then the capacity at that point in time would increase uh, because you're no longer having um, the, the limitation of the, of the 18 students in the classroom. You can now go sure. up to the next level on that. Um, but based off what we most currently have, um, that is the capacities that, that's being provided. Sure. And that's to assume Washington right now would be able to, if it were to tomorrow, no longer be an HER school and just be, I don't know, typical school, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, they would be able to handle the 27 kids in the classroom. Yeah, 20, right, dependent so. upon the grade level, correct. Okay. Correct. So, so we're kind of building in both scenarios here is, is really what's going on when we're looking at these charts is that we're, we're kind of compens or not compensating, but we're, we're building in the idea that if a school were to become an AGR school, or if it were to no longer be an AGR school, it would still be covered under like the capacity, the school's capacity to handle that change. Potentially, um, and some of these schools, as you can see, the over and under capacity, the numbers are very small in some of sure. them. Um, especially at our elementary school level. And that's because we're kind of projecting a decline as well. So and so what happens, at, so for example, it, I don't think it would ever happen, but for example, Lakeside Elementary School, well, right now where it's under capacity, it's, we have room theoretically for 19 more students. Yes. However, if they were to convert to an EGR site, they may actually end up being over capacity. Over capacity. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, for me, I think this is important to, to think about. So I, I'm going to refer there's to yeah. Go there's ahead. sort of two two methodologies mm -hmm. you can do with with predicting or planning for it, and and a little it's it's a little bit difficult because we're dealing with um, existing buildings here, right? So again, chances are most of those classrooms that have 18 students in now are probably uh, a typical size classroom. They're probably uh, you know close to 900 and somewhere between sure. you know eight and 900 square feet. So they they that that size room can handle. 27 or you know 20 you know, students as as we go forward, um, but what what you uh, a little bit of what you're alluding to is is how do we plan for this or what do we do if 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 we're renovating or creating you know again hypothetically a, a new building and there's it's it's sort of neat how the the math actually works out because if you say 27 students two classrooms is 54 right. Um, three AGRs at 18 is 54. So a lot of times for the planning purposes, you'll actually design three classrooms the same size as a two classroom building and the sure. others. And that way, if that shift would ever change, you just move some walls around and you, you're able to kind of accommodate it. The other philosophy is just build all the classrooms the same size. Yes, that's maybe a little bit more space than you need for that number of students and that the lower population, but it, it can accommodate it in the future. So. Okay. But the size of the classroom can also have an impact on the instructional strategies and, and mm -hmm. uh, method methodologies that are used with the students. If you have students in a more mm -hmm. sedentary role, you probably don't need as much capacity. But if you have them highly engaged, moving around the classroom, especially say in a science in a science room, you may need more space. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
and we'll get the historians in the community that will say, I remember when there were, you know, 35 kids in a classroom that, that we now have 18 in. And, and again, it's just education is different now yes. than it was then. So, yes. Um, absolutely, I and mean, we don't we don't typically do the way I just described it, mm -hmm. but that is one methodology you could use to, you know, again the uh, equity type thing and, and, sure. and our issue as well. Um, I mentioned earlier when we discussed the facility report, the facility report uh, originally did not include uh, a budgeting or costing exercise. Um, so I believe this was about a year ago when this was, right, mm -hmm. was about last December, I think, when uh, we presented uh, the costing portion of this. Um, again, so this, this was, again, just reacting to what was in the facility needs. This was not additions. This was not renovations to create special ed spaces, to get rid of art on a cart all those things it was to, to fix and repair um, the needs within the buildings. Um, Do you, just real quick, any high level, just remind us those main things, if, if I recall correctly, we're talking a lot with maybe like exterior doors, yep. sidewalks, yep. playgrounds, those, uh, some of the ADA kind of things. Um, and so when we were looking at that original dollar amount of the hundred and six million dollars that truly again had no bearing whatsoever on the educational use of mm -hmm. the facility Correct. nor does it take into consideration potential future costs associated to maintain the building due to age is correct. that correct correct yep okay yep um Correct. So it was it was interior and exterior building building upgrades. So again, you know, flooring, ceilings, mm -hmm. um, p repairing the walls within the building, uh, building systems, and then exterior improvements, sites, so pavements, sidewalks, those types of types of areas. Um, again, there's two different printouts in your handout. One might be a little bit fuzzier than the other. I think they're both pretty legible, but the, the second one should. Um, it's kind of like going to the eye doctor. Camera one, camera two, or. Uh, lens one, lens two. So, um, to Dr. Cartwright's point, that's exactly right. You can see w along the top here is kind of each of the the main categories um, within uh, that that were budgeted for this. So, ADA accessibility, um, building envelope, doors, windows, um, building interior. This is where our again our flooring, our ceilings, our, our, our walls that need to be repaired. Mm -hmm. Um, the owner items, um, FF and E. Um, so FF and E stands for furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Um, so what we, we included within under that heading was um, like room, like an old classroom that had original cabinetry that's kind of in disrepair and falling apart. So uh, I believe the, the budget in this case kind of accounted for a um, repair of a lot of those types of items. Um, plumbing, uh, plumbing fixtures. Um, again, this is a, I really have to kind of highlight this one and commend the district. This is, this is very unique that we see it. You know, the, the district has done a ton of work to really bring their HVAC systems um, up, to, up, to, up to par. Um, and so we're, we're dealing in a lot of other similar type districts where this number is, is, is ballooned as, as, as well, or a very, very big number. So again, um, congratulations to you guys on, on, on keeping up in that area. It's really, really important and critical. A quick question for you on that particular yeah. area with the HVAC system. So this does not include adding you, in yeah. air conditioning to our school sites. Is that correct? It is correct. Yep. And approximately 66% of our school facilities do not have air conditioning. Is that correct? I believe that is, that correct. is correct. Thank you. Um, electrical. Um, uh, electrical needs and then exterior site improvements so pavements uh, asphalt um, those types of things mm -hmm. uh, we did also include um, down at the bottom the three um, district owned buildings the administrative building the maintenance <coughs> building and the recreational building in this analysis as well <coughs> Um, so again, some overall assumptions. Um, so this was based on kind of last year's construction costs. Again, this was kind of a snapshot in time. Um, the projects were budgeted to include supplemental costs. And what I mean by that, again, uh, design fees, permitting, construction, um, you know, costs and, and uh, you know, construction company costs and stuff. We wanted to try to, to give you a, um, a complete project cost um, for each of these. Again, these are to fix, repair existing systems, materials, finishes, roofing, uh, exterior hardscape. 
Uh, this budget does not include additions or renovation of space for capacity, space, or um, educational needs. Mm -hmm. um, it's not adding systems that are currently not present to, to Dr. Cartwright, so we're not adding air conditioning to the buildings that do not have it. And again, it did not have a factor in it for, for inflation costs. The basics. So it's a lot of information, and, and um, part of what we want to start to introduce uh, tonight is, is this summary document. So um, the, you know, the, the struggle is going to be how do we take uh, a vast amount of information and really distill it down to a very, very simple document that people can, can digest. So we've been working uh, with the district um, on this document um, and uh, kind of wanted to show it uh, tonight. Um, to you. So again, this this um, lists and, and shows. So this is on the uh, this is the eight and a half by eleven document that you have there. Again, so our pretty fine uh, point uh, a text, but again, lo a lot of buildings and information to share. So again, it's mm -hmm. each of the buildings. It's the um, uh, the. Uh, uh, capacity, uh, educational capacity, the current enrollment numbers within there, um, the site size of the buildings. Um, so getting into this a little bit is, is understanding we have some very small sites um, within the district. And um, you know the, the neighborhood school is a really important thing and, 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 and n in no way shape or form trying to, to discount that but there's uh, again the, the point of equity there's some definitely challenges in dealing with some of these mm -hmm. sites that are very small and have mm -hmm. some some larger buildings on it. So again, just recognizing some of um, the issues um, with that. Um, the building areas, um, and then we have the, the vintages of the buildings. Mm -hmm. So when they were originally built, and the best information that we have in terms of when all of the additions <coughs> um, were put onto the buildings. Now this is primarily just additions, so it doesn't include, you know, if a bathroom was renovated in the summer of, you know, 1973. This is kind of some of the, the bigger projects that, that the buildings incurred. Dr. Kirk, right. I had a question regarding the average lifespan of a school. I heard you say in meetings what that is, and I can't remember what the average lifespan is? Um, it's, it's very difficult to quantify. Okay. Um, again, I, we, we go into some districts and the, the building is very valuable to that district. Um, we were up in Florence. They have a three-story um, uh, 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 building, you know, that you probably see in many, of the, that would equate to many of the buildings here. It's an elementary building. They, they love the building. They, they wanted to preserve it. It was very valuable mm -hmm. to them. Um, they wanted to preserve it again Milwaukee historic you know the historic mm -hmm. nature of buildings mm -hmm. they, they mm -hmm. want to preserve them um, so you, you work within the confines and try to find find ways to fix them um, other places we're working up in Sevastopol that's in Door County right now same thing almost the exact same three-story brick building same vintage um, they 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 feel like they've got their useful life out of it it's a 1920s building and they've elected to, to take it down to build to build a new building. They, um, you know, there, there, there's some challenges within it, just getting handicap accessibility right. um, within it. So um, they've elected to go forward with it. Um, we are go forward with with moving it. Um, their use, we we haven't applied it as much, I would say, in the last five or ten years, because I think just again each building and community is different in what they place the importance on their facilities. Um, but there used to be a rule of thumb that if the cost to uh, replace a building, uh, I'm sorry, if the cost to fix a building was 66% of the cost, roughly, of the cost to build a new building, that was kind of a pretty good indication that it might be time to, to look forward, or look look to build a new, new facility. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, that's completely a rule of thumb. Every community and board and uh, you know, it evaluates that differently, but that was okay. kind of something we, you know, industry-wide that, that was kind of looked at. From an educational industry standard, for educational purposes, right. not for building purposes, but for educational purposes, it's usually the average um, lifespan of a school facility is 50 to 60 years. Now okay. again, that is not equating for major right. renovations to the inside, such as what Harvard has done. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because I've I've heard the question of. Well, what about Yale, Harvard, Princeton? These are historically very old buildings, which they is correct. Right. But the inside is not the original building. That's not the original, no, not at all, right. 
I was as as I was looking at this list, I circled <coughs> all the ones that were um, built before 1950, and we have 11 schools that were built before 1950, four that were built in the 1800s, and 13 schools total if you count the rec department and our maintenance department that were, were built in before 1950. That's a that's some really old schools there. I had n I did not realize that we had so many that were. And then, of course, there's the ones that was built right after the Civil War <laughs> in the 1800s, two in the 1800s. Can you talk just a little bit, you mentioned it, um, what is the rec recommended acreage uh, by school level, typically, uh, sure. if, you're, if you're looking at? Sure. Um, the, just, just some ballpark numbers, and, and um, there's, uh, I, I apologize, a chapter and verse, I don't have exactly what the numbers are, but there's, there's some guidelines. They generally say in an elementary school, if, again, you're planning for a new building, um, we generally look for about 15 acres for, for a new school. Mm -hmm. um, a middle school, um, you're probably in the 30, uh, uh, the 30 acre range. And then a high school, you're generally looking um, 40 to 60 acres. And, and the high school is, is a, a particular one be, uh, because of just the, the fields. Um, you know, there's generally more needs for, for, for fields and stuff like that. So that's kind of why there's the range in the high school is, you know, our, do you have two baseball fields, two softball fields, a football field, a track, you know, all of those types of things. And then obviously with high schools, the parking requirement is need for parking okay. is, is really yeah. significant. So. Again, we um, we've 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 built new schools on very small. We just did a, a project in Lacrosse um, within the city. Uh, it was on a um, I believe a four acre site. We built a ninety thousand square foot school on that site. Again, that was really important to that community that they have that school on their site, and uh, it's a, it turned out to be a beautiful project. They're very proud of it, but but certainly there were challenges um, finding space for for playgrounds and green okay. space and parking. So, okay. um, it, it's uh, similarly we did a, a project down in Racine, same thing, a, a brand new school on a um, existing site. It would actually replace the current building on that same site. So. Um, Every project is different and unique, mm -hmm. but again, those are kind of some guidelines that we look into when budgeting for trying to plan for a new building. So the combined elementary and middle would be 45. You just, or is it? Uh, we probably have to evaluate that a little, a little bit differently. But um, I, I would probably say, it, and you probably plan that. That'd probably have be a safe plan. Adding yeah. the two together. Mm -hmm. You'd have to kind of look at what the size of each of the buildings are. Um, so again, uh, w so I kind of touched on the additions. Uh, we have a summation here of the capital maintenance needs. And again, there's a kind of a note on the bottom. And again, we tried to highlight this. This is again, fixing what we have. This mm -hmm. isn't additional space. This isn't additions. Mm -hmm. This isn't renovating um, for any of the educational needs within the buildings. Um, and then the, the final uh, column on this chart is um, our start <coughs> at trying to identify some of those educational needs within the building. So if you flip your sheet over, um, we started to create again a, a kind of a chart to identify on a very high macro level um, what the buildings have in terms of some of those additional spaces that we've been alluding to, the special education, the mm -hmm. um, library art. Do they have library? Do they have um, art? Do they have dedicated spaces? Do we have a shared cafeteria, um, secure entry vestibule? Um, so again, we wanted to try to create kind of a very easy, digestible um, diagram that people can see to, to, to sort of help understand what the needs are. Again. This is not a representation that, that maybe that these spaces are adequate. It's just that they have them in it. So this was, kind of, again, kind of our first pass through trying to highlight and identify um, the spaces. So this doesn't mean that they don't offer this at their school. This just means that there's not a dedicated space for that at their yes, school. Yes, correct. Okay, got it. Hmm. It's starting to work toward, I, I believe you mentioned equity before, so trying yeah. to work t yeah. through, through and, and get to that, that we have, um, that we have tried to creating the equity between the buildings um, and also understanding, you know, again, moving forward um, a little bit deeper dive and are, you know, the next, the next layer of this is, are they adequate, right? Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> right. Okay. What is the notation uh, on the 
under the comments for Oakwood School where it says stage sl slash pit area being converted to maker space. I don't know what maker space means. Um, a maker space is a um, flexible, it's um, a flexible space that can be utilized. Uh, sometimes it's utilized for STEM type okay. activities. Um, it, it's really kind of, um, it, it's sort of a nebulous space. term. It's like just kind of a space to, okay. to do okay. things in really. Um, yeah. okay. It's flexible. Some, some districts, and I'm not sure if this would be your case, but some districts utilize that space after hours for people to come in and, and have mm -hmm. it for, um, they utilize it for projects for students. Mm -hmm. So a teacher can check out that mm -hmm. space and they can do, set up an art project or a science mm -hmm. project or something within that space. So it's, it's kind of just mm -hmm. a flexible space to do stuff really. Yeah, very good, thank you. Okay. <coughs> Um, okay. You're up. <laughs> Great. We just wanted to, to always put in a reminder that, um, you know, even though we have a new governor, we still have revenue limits, um, and those are still very restrictive to the school district. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty as to when we will see a budget. Um, it is a 1921 budget that's there in the workings right now. Um, July 1st is the beginning of our fiscal year. So there's no guarantee that we as a district will have a budget by then from the state. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I just wanted to make you aware of that. And a lot of things Governor Evers have talked about is incre increasing equalization aid to school districts. But because of the revenue limit formula, any more equalization aid we get is just taxpayer relief or property mm -hmm. taxes relief. Mm -hmm. So even though some of the things he's talking about sound really good, but giving us more state aid, it doesn't give us more resources to spend. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll continue to keep you updated on the progress of the state budget as we know more. If I, um, Ms. Moore, if you could maybe elaborate just a little bit. I know you were talking about uh, related to how funds are allocated to the school district. Um, so just emphasizing again, it's really dependent upon how the governor decides to as we say, what category or what bucket the, the governor puts money into because mm -hmm. a common misunderstanding is that sometimes people will just say, oh, they're this, the district's getting more money. Um, but oftentimes if it's categorical funds, it can only be utilized within those categories for which is designated. Um, however, it is money that the district does realize. In other words, we do actually get money for that. Um, however, as uh, Ms. Nora was mentioning before, um, if it's related to um, the equalization age or, or what I say, going into the general fund, mm -hmm. um, because of the revenue limit and what was established back in the 1990s, if, um, if we get additional funds within that general fund, we're more or less a pass-through um, because mm -hmm. of that revenue limit. The money passes through the district we don't realize it and our taxpayers realize mm -hmm. it um, and again that I'm very clear on that as far as revenue limits mm -hmm. um, also I think it's, it's very important for our general public <coughs> to have understanding that um, except for some small things but rather large in the past couple years um, the state does not provide funds to school districts related to capital projects. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's important for you to, for all of us to note. Uh, as I said before, the past couple years they have been giving us funds um, specifically related to like school safety. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and so that was very purposeful and they could only be used for those purposes. Mm -hmm. um, but as our surrounding districts are, um, building or renovating or whatever mm -hmm. they may have um, when it comes to who is paying for that based upon um, how uh, the state funds districts um, Oshkosh area um, taxpayers are actually helping pay for those renovations mm -hmm. and or buildings in our surrounding, well actually all the districts across the state. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on that just a little bit for well, me? Because the, the pot of money for equalization aid is, is a set pot of money. So if another district passes a referendum and collects more state aid, that means it has to come from everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, so because there's only a set pot of money. So when one district spends more, they get more, um, depending upon where they are in that aid formula. So as one district passes a referendum and they now spend more money, 
everybody else gets a little bit less because they're going to get a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Thank also, you. also, just want to touch on it again. I, I, um, as we <coughs> went through this, I, I, I made a point of commending the district for the HVAC improvements that you've done, and, and I, I would think a, a, a lay person would say, well, why don't you do that for some of the other stuff? And again, just want to remind that a lot of that was done through the Act 32. Um, funding mechanism which no longer exists so um, so again that just wanted to point that out. And that was the energy the efficiency, efficiency bar right and we could only use three of those things over so. the last mm -hmm. six years yep. mm -hmm. thank you so uh, again, kind of next steps, um, uh, again, uh, continue to evaluate capacity. Again, we um, kind of saw and understood that, you know, how you look at the numbers or equate the numbers, you know, can, can swing things and change things. Um, evaluate quantity, quality of educational spaces. So again, kind of diving in and understanding what we need, what we need to provide, where we're deficient. Mm -hmm. um, evaluate equity of the facilities di district-wide. Again, we've kind of touched on that point a few times tonight. Um, uh, consider c configurations, uh, building sizes, uh, locations, the uh, grade configurations, um, and, and kind of talking through what's ideal for educationally and operationally. Um, explore solutions identified um, and the facilities <coughs> condition, uh, condition assessment, the capacity study, and the educational need w uh, within the educational needs identified. And then uh, consider community engagement strategies moving forward, such as a, a committee or focus mm -hmm. groups. Uh, I think most importantly, a, a community survey um, at some point in time. Um, that's yes. really, yeah. um, I think, the key one to, to look at and consider. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'll remind the board as well is that uh, as we wait for the results from our um, strategic plan uh, that was just just completed mm -hmm. with our, our open forums and, uh, and the online survey. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm hoping that we will also be able to glean some valuable information as to what priorities our communities are also. Mm -hmm. I'm really back. excited to see that. Uh, because yeah. we were, um, we had, I, I do not know about the face-to-face, -face, but we had over 600 respondents to the Great. online survey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, didn't, I didn't write it down, but you, you set a certain percentage of like if there's a certain percentage of repairs needed for a certain property, property yeah. you want to start thinking about whether to do build new or you know continue to repair the property what is yeah, that is about two-thirds the cost so 66 cost to build new. correct yeah okay mm -hmm. so uh, yeah so so roughly it's like 60 66 66, 66. But again, I, 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 that's completely a rule of thumb. I, you have Based to, on you have to weigh in. You know, again, what what the importance of, of the building is, the site. I mean, that that's really important uh, consideration. Sure. Mm -hmm. And also included in there is um, taken also how the building is actually built mm -hmm. and p potential efficiencies right. that. Um, are involved with that as well uh, because there's a variety of different types of efficiencies of scale as you might say um, when you're looking at mm -hmm. you know the size of schools mm -hmm. uh, as in addition to that um, so those are just things for you to keep in mind uh, because of course um, there's um, operational efficiencies but there's also um, educational efficiencies and what type of services you can provide mm -hmm. to children um, dependent upon the size of the building itself, or you know, the size of mm -hmm. the capacity of the building. Mm -hmm. I think one other thing to keep in mind, I just wanted to remind the board, um, as Stephanie had brought up earlier, how remarkable it was the age of some of our buildings. When we did the facility study, we applied some very uh, industry standards per square foot, per linear foot. These were how we Bray established a lot of these costs. As we start to look at <coughs> some of these very old buildings, it is difficult, if not possible, when, when we start to look at um, should we try to renovate those facilities to make them ADA um, mm -hmm. accessible and trying to get plumbing and trying to get water and trying to get electrical through areas where there isn't a basement, where there's a solid foundation, 18-inch mm -hmm. walls, and they're buried deep within this very, very solid building, it becomes very challenging. And all of a sudden, those numbers that we were given as, as budgetary numbers are no longer applicable. Mm -hmm. So it's important to understand that these are these are good numbers and are good numbers for a preliminary discussion, but when you start to look at the old buildings and you really decide to dive into potentially 
uh, evaluating the, the true numbers, the, the real cost of gutting and renovating the building is likely to be significantly more, right. particularly with the older buildings. Mm -hmm. so keep that in mind. Other comments or questions? Mr. Pesci? Well, like you might uh, yeah, I do, something. but I, I had one more. Well, Martin's actually, it's just—it's not a question, but more of a comment because I remember my first year <laughs> on the board. I was sitting right here next to Dr. Lemberger, and we were debating whether or not to invest the seven million into West for the windows. And mm -hmm. um, Dr. Lemberger said, "You know, eventually we are going to have to address how long we're going to kick this can down the road because we keep investing, you know, seven million here, and now West's investment is twenty-four million." That's a really big number, and I think that moving forward, we have some difficult decisions to make regarding that school. So that was my only All comment. Of them. Yeah. All of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I think my comments kind of go along the lines of the investment that we've done in our properties, mm -hmm. in, in, our, in our buildings over the last 10 years, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and specifically, you know, we've, we've bonded for all those energy efficiency projects and everything and we've installed them we've been really successful at, at doing that and that then puts us in the spot of you know having that conversation about our facilities whether we reconfigure facilities mm -hmm. or whether we want to build new what does that do with that investment that mm -hmm. we've that we've put in that we bonded for that we're going to pay on for you know for the next several years I mean, these are all things that I think are really important things for us to think about too mm -hmm. in this conversation because we've invested already in some ener energy efficiency upgrades to our buildings right. that we might be put in the tough spot of saying is that you know is that investment worth maintaining still mm -hmm. you know and then having to say well uh, no we're not going to do that anymore we're going to build new and we still got to pay on that debt mm -hmm. service for that for that work down the line as well too and I, I you know and I think it just it's it's unfortunate that this conversation is now coming after all of that stuff has taken place mm -hmm. you know because we're I think as a as a board you know it's it's having the, the hindsight and some the hindsight in looking at something and sometimes we look at things in what the present moment and what's available to, for us to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then I'm not saying that we should hold back because we've in made that investment. Right. I'm just saying is that, you know, it's now something that we also have to take into That's account question, of, our, yeah. of our thinking as, as we plan forward. I think it's really important for us, and I know that every one of us understand this here, the direction and the path of our buildings is paramount to the success of our children. Right. And we've gotten to the point where we really, I think we feel the importance of having that conversation mm -hmm. of what needs to really happen next. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's just my, my comments. Right. Dr. Kerr, did you wanna? If I may, I, I think it's just important um, because, and I appreciate the community members that are tuning in tonight or watching this online in the future <laughs> and um, looking at this because we want to make sure that we keep our community informed on this conversation mm -hmm. this is a very serious conversation um, for some of our community members this is like planting an acorn uh, for which they'll never uh, get to enjoy uh, you know the shade of the tree, tree potentially yeah. right um, however for um, some of our other community community members uh, this could potentially whatever decision we make you know uh, it could potentially be an investment into the community because our schools are nothing more than oftentimes a microcosm of the community for which it serves. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing that's really important is schools are in an enormous economic um, driver, driver yeah. to the community for which it belongs to. Um, so for example as these major corporations are moving in or staffing Mm -hmm. We know those were employees. Are they going to choose to live within Oshkosh or not? Mm -hmm. If they choose to live within the Oshkosh area school district, um, more than likely, we know that most oftentimes people reinvest back into their community. Mm -hmm. uh, they make their purchases within that community. Hence why I say it's an economic 
driver mm -hmm. um, and how people make decisions about where they're, they're going to move to and those kind of things, um, especially if, if it's um, individuals who have children mm -hmm. or if anticipate to have children, um, that really, again, drives uh, the economy. Uh, from a business perspective, mm -hmm. and I think that's important for people to notate as well, um, just as we start down this road of, right. of future conversation and some of the things, because there's a, there's a lot here to digest. There's a lot mm -hmm. of conversations we still have to have. Um, so I don't want to say, we need to do this, we need to do this. I don't have those type of answers. I just want to make sure that our community is aware mm -hmm. that this is a very serious conversation and we want people to be involved we mm -hmm. want people to to ask us questions because we're going to, we're going to address those questions and be right. as transparent as possible with this right absolutely can I, thank uh, you can I also just add that I just can I just comment on on your energy efficiency sure um, you know we were replacing systems that really were beyond yeah. their yeah. useful right. life I get it. and in so we and we are saving money every day on utilities because of those decisions so I don't think that and any of that money was was a waste because we we risk it we risk it we, <laughs> we risk um, some of those well, boilers well, stopping in the middle of the winter sure. and so now at least you don't have have that fear. Please don't take my comments as, as those not being oh. uh, necessary steps to have taken because I I, I actually I agree with your statement mm -hmm. um, but my concern comes from the idea of what our next steps might do to that invest mm -hmm. it's not that it's we're not going to still be investing in that, mm -hmm. but it's just that we, you know, and 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 I and I see this a lot because in the world that I work in, sometimes we we buy something and then you know a couple of years down the line we replace that because we found something that replaced the whole unit or mm -hmm. the whole building, and then you get something else that's with that, and and so you didn't get your life out of it, you didn't get your life out of that that investment. And that's the point that I was making is that is that we're at that risk. We needed the district needed to make a decision at mm -hmm. that point mm -hmm. because there was stuff on the line that needed to be done. So mm -hmm. I don't disagree with you. I just have one more point to make. Okay, Mrs. Carla. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm so passionate about this issue. No, you guys know that. <laughs> um, I just for people that might be watching at home, I just wanted to point out that our neighbors are in fact building new facilities. They're both Nina and Fond du Lac are going to the ballot this April and they are building new schools, they are investing in their schools, and we are losing families to these districts because they, you know, people come here to work at the university or they come here to work at Oshkosh Corporation and they look at our schools just from the outside and they say, nope, I'm gonna live in Nina or I'm gonna live in Appleton. And that is happening every day. So I just wanted to throw that out there for people because I, I, I can't even tell you how many times I hear, you know, that these school districts are better than Oshkosh, and they aren't. Their buildings might be better, but we know what happens inside our schools is far superior. And, um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes people will drive by our schools and just keep driving. So that's something to think about, too. Thank you, Mrs. Carlin. Do our high school reps want to comment on anything this evening that you've heard? Um, I know at least for West, like I a couple months ago wrote an article in for Index about like the general fund and just like the schools in general. Mm -hmm. And um, I asked the question of or, like about rebuilding West. And I just know some students have talked about like oh it's getting pretty old or like there's some maintenance issues and things like that. But, like kind of like you guys said, everything within the school is going very well like content wise, but the school itself like the question obviously has to be raised like when is it going to get rebuilt? <coughs> Thank you. Emily, any thoughts you want to share tonight? Okay. Well, there's a lot of information to digest here. And um, as I was listening this evening and reflecting on what I had paged through prior to the meeting, um, tying back to our earlier workshop tonight on how, how do the social studies people look at this, from an economic standpoint, what's the return on investment? Mm -hmm. If we put $107 million into um, the, the kinds of things we were talking about without looking at educational quality and, mm -hmm. and people driving by don't necessarily realize what how we've upgraded but how have we upgraded in terms of the student experience I also reflected on the fact that many of these buildings were were built for children who were going to li li live their lives in the early 1900s 
that's, that's a long time ago, and we'd all agree that life was very different then than it is now. Or children who grew up in the 1950s and 60s. Um, that's a very different era. We're preparing children for the 21st century, and are our buildings equipped to do that, to allow our, our students and our staff to have those experiences that they need to be not only college, career, and community ready, but responsible citizens uh, moving forward. As Dr. Cartwright pointed out, the success of our schools leads to economic success and economic development. Every one of us in this community has a, a stake in how well the children here are educated, and it helps determine what kind of businesses we attract, what kinds of mm -hmm. housing is available, uh, and all kinds of spin-offs. So to me, this is a, is a huge um, issue to take a look at, but I think we're probably at a point now, given that we had a report in the fall, and now we've had this extensive conversation, we need to give administration some direction mm -hmm. as to what what we what we need to do next. What does this board mm -hmm. expect moving forward? Um, again, we define the what, um, mm -hmm. and administration helps us define the how and gets into processes. So, <laughs> where do, where does this board want to go from here? What direction mm -hmm. do you need to give? Do we need to give collectively to administration? wasn't prepared to make that type of decision I know, tonight. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I guess it could be referred to. It could be the steps that you see yeah. up there. We also have, we also mm -hmm. are eagerly awaiting, at least I think many of us are eagerly awaiting for the results of the uh, community survey and study that was led by Oshkosh for Education in terms of the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. And um, it would, it would be helpful, I think, for us to know what the community is thinking about Absolutely. facilities. I too have heard what Mrs. Carlin uh, shared um, in terms of, of people saying that the quality of the buildings in Oshkosh is not what they'd like to see for their children. But yet, when, we've, when we recently had the report on student performance, we as a district are exceeding expectations. So. Um, there, there are just so many variables here, and maybe the board isn't prepared tonight to give administration direction, but I think it's something that we all need to think about um, and can contact Dr. Cartwright uh, individually on mm -hmm. because w that's not a conversation we can have outside of this boardroom um, in order to stay within the confines of the open meeting law. So. Um, I, I guess I'm suggesting at this time, unless somebody has a better idea, that if you have whatever thoughts you have about moving forward, and it certainly could be things from up there or things that were presented in October, to share those with Dr. Cartwright so that we can And I would move um, forward. humbly request that we please do that during an open board meeting mm -hmm. um, oh, right. so that I can ensure that I avoid uh, walking worms. That would be a good idea. Thank you. That would be a wonderful idea. So let's, let's be prepared uh, to see that on a future agenda item, whether that would be March 20th, although I think that's likely to be a full agenda because that's our uh, annual board self-evaluation. More likely it might be a, an April agenda item. But, that, but be thinking about that because we do need to do more than just say thank you for this report, right. uh, although that's important. But where are we going to go from here? Uh, we don't want to to just leave this and as uh, Mrs. Carlin referred to, kick the can down the road. I think the time has come where, where some action needs to be taken. Mm -hmm. um, Jim, Alton. do you have, so I know that we have next steps. Um, do you have like a time frame for these? So these are the next steps that you have, you guys have kind of collectively put together that we should do and I agree with um, Dr. Herzog that we should look at those add to them see how we feel and then discuss those maybe that needs to be like the the future agenda like look at the next steps and and um, and and what those look like or, or what the timeline is or where where you know 
I would like to wait to have that meeting when after we get the results from the strategic plan to see where the community mm -hmm. is at on this too to make sure to see where the they're aligning or not aligning or whatever it may be that would be great mm -hmm. so back to my question Jim is do you have time frames on some of your next steps like are we working on them is that what you're doing are you waiting for the guidance from us like where are you guys on these next steps well I think collectively uh, okay. where we left it was exactly as you had said we're waiting for uh, the results for your next uh, strategic plan okay um, should that strategic plan uh, and, and we believe it will guide us toward uh, at least one part of it uh, toward doing something with facilities okay. I think ultimately we need to continue the conversation of what what does that what does that mean okay and uh, and I, I think one of those steps will be developing a timeline mm -hmm. um, to okay. help okay. come up with solutions Good. but okay. Um, I guess that's a discussion that you need to have. Yeah, yeah okay. and not. I, I know everyone gets uneasy when you talk about referendum, but that's kind of part of this too. As you sort of look out and say, okay, what would what would be a good, you know, if again, I'm not saying we're going to referendum, but you you kind of have to play it backwards from that and say, okay, well, if we right. if we want to target the presidential eleven and uh, the presidential election. Uh, 2020 November of 2020 um, if that's a target then we kind of work backwards from that mm -hmm. you sort of work back when do we need to have a survey ready when do we need to have the information for the survey and and that's typically what we would do in this process is sort of um, identify a, an end game and it doesn't mean that we have to go then but at least we're working towards a, right. you know a date and if we're not ready then we just you know go push it off longer um, obviously, this year there's the there's that we we would not make it for April because you have mm -hmm. to have your resolution 75 days. Uh, there's not a November um, election this year, mm -hmm. um, so you'd probably be likely looking April of uh, 2020 or November of 2020 at the very earliest. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, there's a lot of work to do. So I mean, um, mm -hmm. are either of those realistic? I can't answer that question mm -hmm. right now, but. Um, that's usually a good place to start is you know what what's sort of the end game and then kind of work back mm -hmm. from that so everything on this wait, list oh, oh, sorry, sorry. time please <laughs> mr. mr. Evans is everything on this list is that have to everything have to be covered on the referendum or is there things within budget that we can, can work on well there's a prioritization <coughs> exercise I think we go through too again you know the, what what's like 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 was mentioned. I mean, the, the HVAC there was <coughs> there was need there, right? Our our boilers were on the, the very edge, of, you know, of, of, of failing. So that there was, and, and so you, I think there's a prioritization that needs to happen in this process too. Um, there's probably a um, an evaluation from a tax perspective of what's an achievable number from a referendum. I mean, if if um, you know if we can if if we think the community will only support X amount of money that, that we have to work towards that and what, what can we achieve. Um, maybe we have to look at if, does this need to be phased over time, you know, um, so that there's, there's kind of a, a component of that. Mm -hmm. I think part of it too is just a, a master planning effort of where do we want to see the district in, again, whether that's 10 years, five years, 20 years, um, and then what are we doing to, to work towards that so that we're not building a classroom now to serve one need and then we find out you know right. five years from now oh we were now we need to do something else in that spot so we want to make sure we're working towards I think an, an end goal, uh, some type of, type of an end goal which again is <coughs> supportive of what we see in terms of trends for enrollment and and, and, and any particular thing so again it's kind of weaving everything together mm -hmm. and if I could I just want to add when this conversation began about a year and a half ago um, one of the first things we had said is although we have a 10-year facilities plan and we've documented some facilities problems what we really wanted to do was to create a 20 30 maybe 50 year plan for our district something that will live beyond right. this school board this administration something that future groups can pick up and understand okay. what our vision was and how this district should grow so as as Bob had indicated we don't want or we'd want to create as few stranded investments as possible and to Jim's point this we need to make sure that we don't lose track that this if if we go or when potentially we go to a referendum it is not a, a deferred maintenance referendum no. uh, we have done that in the past and we can do that and that's that's more of a, a corrective mechanism um, if we're really truly following a vision maybe we do pick up on some deferred maintenance to help extend 
certain buildings' lives because as part of our whole evaluative process, at a strategic level, we decide that that has value and we're going to get the life out of that value. Maybe this particular building that doesn't work. And I think that goes to your question, Kelly, about you know where do we go? And as as we as we get that direction from uh, from our strategic plan and, and from you as a board, we start evaluating buildings and starting to really get down into um, more detailed dollars as to what's viable, what's not viable, what's driven by educational value, what's driven by the actual brick and mortar itself, mm -hmm. and all those variables come into play and help paint a much clearer picture of what our decision ought to be mm -hmm. uh, for all of our facilities. Mm -hmm. right. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You were going to win on something that Mrs. Um, Olmstead? Uh, Jim just answered it. Okay. I was, I was, we jumped so far ahead where for me I was, um, there's so many more questions and so many more s um, information I need before that I could ever feel comfortable making a decision, right. a dis decision about even thinking about referendum or going mm -hmm. forward with right. that or anything right. else. This just, this is so skimming the surface. There's so mm -hmm. much more that, so Jim absolutely answered it, going into more studies and looking at it and, and really what is right. the, the best for Oshkosh. And mm -hmm. um, for, for all of us, I would say that the community and their, their input is invaluable. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. I really want to see right. those and, and where, I think that'll help guide us of, of where we mm -hmm. need to go with this study and how further, <laughs> which direction we need to go in with it, mm -hmm. so. Dr. Cartwright, do you have some sense of when um, the Oshkosh for Education group will be sharing the results of the strategic uh, currently the gathering? The my apologies. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, currently, the uh, results are at University of Wisconsin um, Oshkosh, okay. and they're analyzing the results in order to give us a report back on that. Um, once we get those results, I anticipate that being back, um, if not at the end of this month, um, towards the beginning of next month. Okay. Um, okay. So we're about a month out, I should okay. say, um, from receiving those results. Once we receive the results, uh, candidly, we'll, um, at the administration team, we'll need a little bit of time to kind of dive into it so that we can give you executive summaries mm -hmm. on the major the main themes right um, okay. that are coming from that as well so I would anticipate probably you know for informational purposes to, to come and provide you with information uh, towards the second board meeting in April thereabouts that's mm -hmm. that seems like a reasonable timeline but again I would reiterate for my fellow board members to be thinking about yep. all this and digesting Absolutely. this the gathering information from your respective groups and mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. coming prepared for that meeting when we schedule this again as, as an agenda item for right. uh, what direction we need to give to administration moving forward. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions from the board members, students? I want to thank the three of you for mm -hmm. this presentation. You've given us a lot to think about uh, as we move forward and think about the, the future of our students and the future of our community right uh, moving forward so so thank you for all your hard work on this mm -hmm. yeah. and I know we'll be having having you back to the table <laughs> so I look forward to that thank you at this time are there any requests for future agenda items yes. other than this one yep. are there any announcements yeah, I have one Mr. Uh, since those have us kind of a serious Workshop. I'm going to attempt to lighten the mood here a little bit. I'll, I hold in my hand the latest issue of the Wisconsin School News, which we all know is a publication from the Wisconsin Association of School Boards. And the Oshkosh district was well represented in here. And this picture here, we have our board president in the WASB delegation or uh, delegate group photo. We have our resident technical. Pro, Dr. Gunlock, <laughs> featured in an article. Awesome. And we have a rather bored looking delegate <laughs> at the delegate assembly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's probably one that we were doing uh, the second or third or fourth amendment that I was holding up or down. And 
But this is a recap of the convention. If we would have had this last week, we could have just handed this out to everybody and they could have done oh, yeah. our workshop. <laughs> right. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Evans. I haven't had a chance to look at my, my copy of that yet, but I uh, appreciate your executive summary. Thanks, Jim. And that leads into, with your professional development, we need to um, make sure that all board members uh, complete the survey for the dates for the um, two nights we're looking for Done. in the month of April. That uh, We're asking you that you complete that by tomorrow so that we can schedule those uh, professional development dates with our consultant, Mrs. Stinsky, on the um, key work of school boards. So make sure you take care of that if you haven't already, and I thank you for that. Dr. Cartwright. I just have one quick announcement. I want to okay. do a special recognition to our school um, social workers. Uh, this week is National School Social Worker Week. Uh, which serves to highlight the tremendous impact that our school social workers can have in helping students achieve um, student success. And in the Oshkosh Area School District, we're very fortunate to have um, an outstanding group of school social workers who are very dedicated to our students, families, and staff. And so I just wanted to make sure I highlighted that, and I read that directly from an email that came from Mr. Cameron um, that uh, was sent out across the, the district today. Very nice. Thank you, Dr. Kurgring. Any other announcements? Then I would entertain a motion to adjourn to executive session for one, considering the employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises authority under Wisconsin Statute 19.85.1 paren 1 paren c, a employee performance, and two, Deliber deliberating or negotiating the purchase of public properties, the investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session under Wisconsin Statute 1985, 19.85 paren 1 paren e, a health insurance. So moved. Second. Please call the roll. Carolyn? Aye. Carolyn Aye. Eliason? Evans? Aye. Evans Aye. Aye. Thank you very much, everyone. Oops, sorry. <laughs> you didn't.